Hi everyone, my name is Naomi. I'm glad you could join us today. As you can see, we're not in the church building as usual due to the construction work down there. Instead, we bring you today's service from Scott's Lounge Room. So, from Scott's Lounge Room to yours, welcome to Church Online.
privilege it is to be able to sing of God's great love and grace to us in Jesus together, even if we're not all in the same room. I do hope that you are able to gather, to gather together with even one other person or in a gang today, because as Kelsey reminded us last week, we are better together. Well, I was reading a book the other day about anti-gravity. It was impossible to put down. Do you know what a dog is called that can do magic? A labracadabrador. <gasps> no good? Well, how about I hand it over to some of my friends? What do you say to a kangaroo on its birthday? Happy birthday. I'm so good at sleeping. I can easily do it with my eyes closed. Why can't you hear the pterodactyl go to the toilet? Because the pee is silent. What did the Kiwi say to the Jewish guy? 
Oh, hey, Bru. Never trust atoms. They make up everything. I've got a great joke about construction. Actually, I'm still working on it. I can't. Nice to um. meet you, Dad. Uh, oh, Ben! I could tell a joke about pizza, but it's a little bit too cheesy. When does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes apparent. What the way I was like eating fish and chips. So I ordered a chicken and an egg online. I'll let you know. I like telling dad jokes and sometimes he laughs. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. But it wouldn't be a Father's Day celebration without a few dad jokes, right? One of the privileges of being a dad is being able to embarrass your kids. And dad jokes are certainly a good way to get a decent, oh dad, reaction out of them. Well, on this Father's Day, we want to have some fun together. But let's also stop to take a moment to thank our great God for our fathers and to pray for those who find this day hard. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fathers who raised us. Lord, please give all fathers wisdom, patience, courage, and above all love for their children. And we ask that you bless those without fathers. Please surround them with godly men to teach, affirm, and guide them, and to point them towards your great love for us all. We pray for those for whom today is a hard day, for those fathers whose relationships with their children have been difficult or disappointing, for those who have been denied the chance to be fathers, and for those whose years of parenting have been cut short by the loss of a child. We pray that you will fill us all with your fatherly presence and abiding love today. Amen. Well, let's take a moment to lift our eyes from our earthly fathers to our heavenly father. We all, as fathers and mothers, daughters and sons alike, have fallen short of his glory. So let's join together in confessing our sins to our loving heavenly father, who sent his only son to die in our place. Please pray with me. O oh Lord our God, you know us better than we know ourselves. As we come before you now, believers and doubters alike, we all share a deep need, for we are all lost without your grace. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Test us and know your, our troubled thoughts. Give us true repentance. Forgive us all our wrongs. Transform us by your spirit to live for you each day, to learn to serve each other, and through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, to come at last to heaven. Amen. As we come to hear from God's word today, we'll be looking at what it means to live such good lives here on earth. One of the applications with this passage is addressed to wives and husbands. So we're really excited to let you know about a great resource that is now available for couples online, building a safe and strong marriage. This is the marriage building course that we've been using at our St. Matt's Weekends Away for couples. This new online version runs over five easy sessions, which you can do at home at your own pace. This will give you a great opportunity to stop and take some time to nurture and build your ma marriage. This is a really valuable at a time when health restrictions have put extra strains on marriages. So if you'd like to find out more, then go to www.buildingmarriage.com. Well, this week in Kids Church, we're going to be going on a scavenger hunt to find out how we can live such good lives as strangers in this world so everyone will know that we love and follow Jesus. I hope you've got your running shoes on. Let's go to Kids Church Online.
Hi, I'm Kate and I attend the 6.30 congregation with my husband Max and it is my pleasure to read from the Bible for us today. Today we're reading from 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11 to 3 7. I'll give you a moment to find it in your Bibles. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to obtain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, honor the emperor. Slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only as those who who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no defeat, deceit was found in his mouth. When they held their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Hi, my name's Scott. I'm one of the ministers from St. Matthew's. We're actually filming today from my living room. So if you're really polite, I might invite you over, put the kettle on. But actually, I will need you to have your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 2. And as you do that, it's worth saying there are some awkward verses in the Bible. Some of them are, are awkward just because they include harmless hyperbole. Like, for example, at the end of John's Gospel, where John writes, uh, Jesus did many other things not recorded, and if they were all written down, not even the whole world would have enough room for the books that would be written. Not even the whole world, John, a bit of an exaggeration there. Sometimes the Bible is awkward because the events it describes are awkward. In the Old Testament book of Judges, there is a judge called Ehud, and he drives a sword through an obese king called Eglon in his ensuite bathroom. And the king's servant, supposing that he was relieving himself, waited to the point of embarrassment, it says in the text, before going in to find their dead king on the floor. Uh, that's awkward. Leviticus in the Old Testament is full of awkward verses about infectious diseases, mold and mildew, what you can and can't eat when you were and weren't clean. Here is my personal favorite, Leviticus 13 verse 40. When a man has lost his hair and is bald, he is clean. If he's lost his hair from the front of his scalp and has a bald forehead, 
he is clean. Just a real handy little verse I keep in my back pocket and bring out whenever I need. But the verses before us today are really in a whole other category of awkward. Uh, because they seem to not only encourage the practice of slavery, but also justify a form of marriage in which a, a wife is repressed by an overlord of a husband. And so you might be smugly sitting there in your living room wondering how I'm going to get out of this one. Well, we'll wait and see, won't we? But with careful attention to the words and their context, I think these verses neither justify slavery um, or a brutish marriage. In fact, after the talk, we're going to be praying for an end to slavery in our modern world. But friends, today is still going to be awkward for us. And these verses are going to require us to be countercultural, probably just in a different way than you might at first expect. The way the passage before us today works is by first introducing a general principle or dynamic that we're going to incorporate into our Christian lives. And that is called live good lives. And then the Apostle Peter applies that in one particular way, submit yourselves. And then he, th he gives what I think is four or five examples of ways in which we are to do that. So there's a general principle, live good lives. And then a particular application, submit yourselves. And then four or five specific examples of how to do that. Well, I think that's how today's passage works. So let's rip in. That general principle of live good lives is at the top of the passage. And so it's important to read it again, um, verses 11 and 12. Read along with me in your own Bibles. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So you can clearly see that principle, live good lives. But before we even think about what it might mean to live good lives, we need to note the way that we are described, because that is key. So if you have a look at verse 10 that we looked at last week, that describes us as Christians in flowery, gushing terms that ought to warm our hearts if there's any life left within us. Among other things, we are described as a people belonging to God or God's special possession. Now the people of God when we formerly weren't. But when you just flick over one verse into verse 11, we're also described as foreigners and exiles, people who don't belong here. I mean, we belong to God, but we don't belong here. We are, as our series title suggests, away from home while we're in this world. Like that description at the start of the book where God's elect exiles, foreigners and exiles in our culture. And that's a key reason that drives the live good lives instructions that Peter gives. And so you'll see in verse 11 that the principle is stated in the negative and quite strongly, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So part of why we live good lives is because that impacts upon us, upon our souls. But then in verse 12, we see the same principle stated in the positive live such good lives among the pagans. And that's just Peter's sort of general word for unbelieving folks. It's not rude at all. That though they might accuse us of wrongdoing, they will actually see our good deeds and glorify God. And so it's stated negatively, abstain from sinful desires and positively live such good lives because it impacts our own souls, but also because it impacts unbelieving folks those who Peter calls pagans who live around us. I wonder if you've ever had the sense that you're being watched. I don't necessarily mean in a sinister way like you're being stalked. I mean, if you're a parent, you would know that your kids watch everything you do. I mean, they hear everything that you say and then they use it against you in the most mischievous ways. I mean, people think children are cute and adorable. I tell you, they're criminal masterminds. They really are. But you might have also noticed it on your computer. I mean, why is it when I'm searching for bike tires online that the next day when I'm reading the newspaper online, I start to see ads for bike tires pop up everywhere. It's like they're watching my every move. And I'm sure you've experienced that as well. 
You know, if you let it be known that you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, I guarantee that people will be watching you too, very closely. And so Peter instructs us to live good lives, not only for our own sake, but for the sake of unbelievers around us, some of whom are likely to be hostile. They might accuse us of wrongdoing, but ultimately because it might lead them to glorify God. It's so interesting how he puts it. Live good lives. So that's the top level principle for us people belonging to God who are foreigners and exiles away from home in this world. Live good lives. But as the passage just progresses, Peter identifies one application that carries through from chapter 2, verse 13, uh, all the way until at least chapter 3, verse 8, and probably even further. And that application is submit yourselves. Submit yourselves. The Apostle Peter, this rock upon whom the whole church is built, Jesus' right-hand man, speaks about it in four or five ways. And uh, let me be honest, some of them are pretty pointy. And so we naturally resist, I think, the idea of submitting to anyone uh, or anything. If we're honest, we'd probably say that resisting submission is almost the air that we breathe in 21st century secular Australia. I mean, we were founded by convicts, the European chapter of our history. So there's a a rich vein of anti-authoritarian blood that runs right through Australian culture. And because Western culture is so individualistic, we're naturally opposed to taking leadership from anyone who might tell us what to do. And so we might naturally resist Peter's application of his general principle of live good lives. But I believe that you do want to live a good life. And so we've got to grapple with this text instead of just resisting. Well, the first example is an instruction to submit ourselves to governing authorities or human authorities there in verses 13 to 17. And we don't have time to go into this in great detail, and that's okay, because we've covered it in more detail both in the Winter Hotspot series and also in our time in Ecclesiastes. But but you can see that from verse 14, that as Christians we obey human authorities because God has supplied them for the good ordering of our society even when they're not Christian, even when they might enact laws and rules that might be opposed to what we believe. You can see from verse 15 that general principle again, obey human authorities or doing good, he calls it in verse 15, because that will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. In other words, unbelieving folks around us will notice us doing good and that will quiet their accusations. So, for example, when our Honourable Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, requests that we wear masks and don't sing at church, we don't go, get stuff, Gladys, you don't own us, Jesus rules this church. We go, no problems, Premier. I mean, it's it's not convenient. It's uncomfortable. It really does restrict what we'd like to do. But she's the boss on this one and we want to be good citizens, and we want to love our neighbours well, and so it's no trouble at all for us to submit to her leadership. Submission, when you think of it, has a wide range of meanings, doesn't it? Uh, It can mean quite harmlessly handing in your essay at school or university. You might say, I've submitted my assignment, uh, or my application form, or my tax return. But then much less harmlessly, submission in fields of wrestling or mixed martial arts occurs when you yield to your opponent because they've outmaneuvered you or they've overpowered you. I mean, that looks painful and it also results in an immediate defeat. In other words, it hurts and it means you lose. And I think it's fair to say that we bring that sort of idea to our understanding of submission in life More generally, we think it hurts and we think we lose. We would probably bring that to verse 18's instruction to slaves to submit themselves. And I'd like to deal with that in a bit more detail in a moment. So we can um, jump down now to chapter 3 verse 1 where you can see that instruction again repeated to wives. And without doubt we bring this 
negative connotation of submission to the instruction in 3 verse 1 to wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And it really does at this point start to feel awkward, doesn't it? And moreover, it sounds like it hurts and that somebody loses. Wives, submit to your husbands. How can we possibly say that in 21st century Australian culture? When this verse and the ones that follow would have been used by some men to harshly treat the women that they had vowed to love and protect. Surely we should just cut that bit out. Well, I agree. We should just cut that bit out. If submission means that a husband should harshly treat his wife, bossing her about while she meekly services his every desire. I mean, if that's what it means, go ahead, cut it out. Of course, you'd have gathered that I don't think that's what it means. And I think uh, submission can be properly defined as wise and willing support for someone's leadership. And so wives are being asked by scripture, mind you, not by their husbands, certainly not by men in general, to wisely and willingly support their husband's leadership. And it's not because he's better or smarter than you. He may or may not be. I mean, he's certainly not perfect. And it doesn't mean you can't disagree with him because a good leader is always able to admit shortcomings, doesn't always have to be right, get their own way, or have the final word. It's again interesting to note the reason why Peter gives for submission in verse 1, so that any of those husbands don't believe the word. They may be won over to the claims of Christ without words by the behaviour, that is the living good lives of their Christian wives. And that thought line, unbelievers are watching us all the time, just seems to run through this passage, doesn't it? You will see if you look at verse 7 that there is an instruction to the husbands that is in some way paralleled, although not identical. Husbands, verse 7, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect. You see, husbands, you don't get to insist that your wife submits to you. You get to focus on being considerate and understanding, treating her with respect and honour, and ultimately serving her by putting her uh, needs, her preferences, her comforts, her good before your own. That's what you get to focus on. And so on this Father's Day, a day which is devoted to our men, could the husbands amongst us devote themselves freshly to taking responsibility in their marriage and families rather than taking a back seat? To taking initiative uh, spiritually and emotionally, being respectful rather than dismissive, and self-sacrificially serving and loving your wives so that an instruction to wives to submit to their husbands is a delight. So that it's not a burden for them to wisely and willingly support that sort of leadership. It's unfortunate that we don't have time to deal with this in any more detail, uh, which is a shame because it really deserves uh, lots of airtime in its own right. Uh, Kelsey's very helpfully put together a, a one-pager, double-sided, with um, further explanation and thoughtful ideas, which we can get to you if you want to ask about that. But for now, can I just return to the section about slaves submitting to their masters, which is kind of the third point of application of this principle of submission. I should say before we go any further that slavery and marriage aren't parallel scenarios, although um, some of you might joke that being married to your husband feels like that. Uh, marriage was created by God, commanded by God, even thoroughly endorsed and esteemed by him. Slavery, on the other hand, wasn't created by God. Uh, it's not endorsed by him. So please don't hear me say that we are equating or that the Apostle Peter is equating the slave-master relationship with the husband-wife relationship. They're vastly different. Although both relationships are kind of touched upon by this application of submission. But on our passages, words about slavery, some might say, look, that encourages slavery. The Bible encourages slavery, or at least it doesn't encourage masters to free their slaves. And I just need you to hear me say that's factually incorrect. Uh, for no less reason than because the archetypal event of the Old Testament, the, the Exodus 
out of Egypt was a God-ordained liberation from slavery. I mean, the rest of the Old Testament looks back to that emancipation as the great act of God in history of his people. You know also that liberation from slavery forms the theological backdrop to Jesus' life, death and resurrection, which frees us from our slavery to sin, death and the devil. Furthermore, in the New Testament book of Philemon, the Apostle Paul petitions for Philemon, who was a Christian master, to release his slave Onesimus so that he might be both a free man as well as a dear brother in the Lord. And again in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21, the Apostle Paul encourages slaves to gain their freedom where they can. So it's not true that the Bible encourages slavery. But I guess the broader reality is that slavery in the New Testament times is quite different to what we first imagine, which is uh, typically either black Africans who were kidnapped from the African continent to work on the cotton or tobacco plantations in the deep south of the United States, or those enslaved today as sex workers or factory workers against their will and with no hope of release, for whom we're about to pray in just a few moments. No, first century slaves often sold themselves into slavery to repay debts, for example. The usual term for slave in the New Testament is a word that means bonded servant, one who sold himself into slavery for financial reasons. And it wasn't until later that that term came to refer to slaves who were the spoils of war. Many first century slaves were well educated. They rose to prominent positions within their households. They were usually the tutors or the guides of their master's children. They were often treated with respect. They could marry, run a business, accumulate wealth, purchase their freedom, and were normally set free by the age of 30, according, according to Roman law. Now, obviously, there were also many abuses against slaves as well. But did you know that as much as two-thirds of the Roman Empire were slaves at the time of the writing of the New Testament? Two-thirds. Simply a feature of society that the Apostle Peter couldn't overturn or even condemn for fear that many slaves would starve. And there was also the fear that any revolt by slaves might be met with a brutal response, which had happened less than a century earlier after a revolt led by Spartacus in 73 BC, which caused Rome to treat slaves in the west of the empire much more harshly than those in the east. And so this passage doesn't encourage slavery and God doesn't condone it. It simply acknowledges the reality of it in that culture and the relative power that the apostles had. They weren't presidents who could write great proclamations of emancipation. They were embattled leaders of a fledgling religion addressing their congregations who tended to be at the lower end of power structures. The Apostle Peter couldn't address pagan masters here, they just weren't his audience. Although there is an implicit instruction to Christian masters to treat their slaves well. Now today we are in a position to pray for and work for the release of modern day slaves, which is quite a, a different category altogether. And we're gonna do that shortly. We're gonna do that sincerely. But in line with the general argument of this section, Peter asks slaves to respect their masters, even if their masters are harsh. He expects slaves to work hard for their masters, those who are good and those who are harsh. He requests that they submit themselves to their masters rather than rebel against them. And again in verse 20, you see that that idea of doing good, of living good lives in the midst of hostile unbelievers in order to bring commendation to God and from him. Now, I don't think this is the exact same situation, but this principle can apply to those of us who are workers as we relate to our bosses. Should we respect them? Should we work hard for them? Should we submit to them? Well, not if they ask us to do things which are immoral or illegal, but where it is willing and wise support of their leadership, then the answer is yes. So work hard and be diligent and stop moaning and quit complaining about your colleagues and get on with it and add value and become trusted and be reliable and live good lives amongst unbelievers that though they might accuse you of doing good, or doing wrong, I should say, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. And by the way, Christian bosses, you need to be a decent, honest, caring 
and supportive boss too. Everyone submit to human authorities. Slaves, says Peter, submit to your masters. Uh, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands respect your wives. Ultimately, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, All of you be like-minded, love each other, be compassionate and humble. I mean, we all have to submit to each other in Christian love and humble service. Nobody, nobody who is a believer escapes this. And so what is it that will drive this sort of behavior that is so countercultural? that it's even awkward. In this passage, did you notice the fifth person who submits? All of us, verse 13. Slaves, verse 18. Wives and husbands, chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. All of us again there in chapter 3, verse 8. But in 2, verse 21 to 25, there's one other person who submits. And it's the Lord Jesus himself. There is one other person who lived a good life amongst unbelievers. Verse 21, read it with me. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. Did he live a good life amongst unbelievers? Verse 22, he committed no sin, no deceit. He did not retaliate. He made no threats. Who did he submit himself before exactly? Verse 23, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly he submitted himself before the sovereign purposes of god and which unbelievers did his life and obedient death impact was it not you and me amongst many others verse 24 by his wounds we have been healed have we not verse 25 Return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Have we not? All because he lived such a good life amongst us. All because he submitted himself to God's sovereign plans for Jesus. Well, as we finish up, friends, there is a lot in the Bible that sounds awkward. Though living good lives doesn't sound immediately odd, does it? But as foreigners and exiles here, away from home, living good lives in the midst of unbelievers, it is going to feel awkward from time to time, maybe a lot of the time. But if it leaves people healed by Jesus' wounds, returning to the shepherd of their souls and glorifying God on the day that he returns, then I have to say I'm okay with awkward. And I hope you are too. IGM is a global organization and our mission is to protect poor people from violence, including from slavery. I'm Hiroko Swai and my husband Steve and our two daughters, um, we attend the 5 o'clock service at St. Matt's and we've been coming for two years. And I'm a lawyer by training and currently I'm the um, advocacy researcher at International Justice Mission Australia. It's hard to believe that there are 40 million people in slavery right now around the world. Um, just to give you an example of what that looks like, um, last September um, there was a case in South Asia um, where there were 76 victims who were rescued from um, jewelry making factories. Um, 44 of them were children and the youngest boy was 10 years old. Now all these um, boys and young men were trafficked from a state that was about 1,600 kilometers away from where they ended up. And they had been made to work 14 hours a day, so from 10 a.m. until midnight every single day. Um, they were stuck in um, a little upstairs room um, under lock and key. Um, they were all sleeping in the same room um, on thin straw mats. And um, they were expected to actually um, produce uh, hundreds of pieces of um, gold jewelry every day and um, they weren't given any protective equipment so they were handling harsh chemicals they were actually breathing in uh, fine metal dust and the owner actually kept them under camera all the time so that they wouldn't run away so these were boys and young men who couldn't go outside who were just trapped and couldn't do anything um, 
Someone, um, a lawyer, actually received a tip and contacted International Justice Mission. Um, IJM uh, went to the local authorities and together they were able to rescue these um, um, men and boys um, who were in seven um, factories. So when you think about what it means to combat slavery, um, you can imagine that physical rescue is only just a small part of it. Um, so obviously there is the physical rescue, um, freeing people from that situation of slavery. But then you also need to secure justice for the victims, which means making sure that the people responsible, the ones who enslave them, are arrested and prosecuted. Now IGM does all of this um, in partnership with local police, government social workers, and um, with the court system and um, IJM partners with them on actual cases, um, lends them their expertise, resources, um, provides training, and, um, and so this actually strengthens the justice system so that over time um, the justice system can actually do the work that they're supposed to do to actually uh, protect those who are vulnerable. So I first became involved in anti-slavery work um, about 14 years ago in Canada, when I first read about the situation of um, kids who were um, exploited for commercial sexual exploitation in Cambodia, I was just really horrified and agitated. And um, that was um, the beginnings of God just um, stirring something in me. Um, I was feeling the weight and the gravity of human sinfulness and depravity and I was just horrified um, and angry at the injustice done to the innocent children. And then I was also grappling with how this that coincides with God's justice, His compassion, His mercy, His sovereignty and His power. And so I read lots of books about um, God's justice and grapple with scripture. And around that same time, God brought into my life um, like-minded people. Um, and also the um, executive director of International Justice Mission in Canada, and so I became a volunteer and kind of jumped in. I did that for many years, and then um, when I moved to Sydney, I became involved with um, IGM Australia as a volunteer, and then now, more recently, I've been on staff. And um, I get to kind of grapple with the issues of slavery and just sort of think about how um, slavery um, works in given situations and how to address that and combat that and, and then advocating with parliamentarians, um, with the government on how they can be changing laws and policies to combat slavery both in Australia and internationally. I think my most impactful experience um, with um, doing this kind of work and with IJM was when I got to go visit um, one of the field offices in the Philippines and in Cebu and um, the kind of casework they do there um, is called cyber sex trafficking and it's basically a really horrific form of online exploitation of children. When I went um, to the field office um, we got to visit a shelter and I was almost undone when um, I met some of the kids. Um, the youngest at this particular shelter was only two years old, a little girl, and had endured really horrific things. But what was amazing was that um, despite all the things that they experienced, I just really saw evidence of God's power um, and transformation at work in these kids' lives. And so even though they've gone through this horrific experience, um, when we saw them, we were able to just play and laugh with them. They're dancing and singing and joyful. And so I was just really um, struck by the power of God in their lives, um, the resilience of kids, and that despite the darkness, that there is hope and that our God is great and He's wonderful. If you want to find out more about modern slavery, about IGM's work, or how you can get involved, um, you can get in touch with me via, via the church and the online uh, connection card. Or if there is something today that um, really disturbed you, we'd like to talk to somebody about it or pray with somebody, again, please use the online connect card um, and the, someone will get back to you from the church. Let's take a moment to pray about modern slavery. And as we do so, we'll be joining with hundreds of other churches who are learning about modern slavery, praying for it to end, learning about God's heart for justice, and joining in the fight. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Loving and compassionate God, 
we come before you in prayer, heartbroken by the stories we hear, unable to fully comprehend the horror of women, men, and children subjected to such abuse and violence. We lament that our world is a place where there is such evil, that 40 million men, women, and children are trapped in slavery. We grieve the injustice and the depth of pain and sorrow. We cry out as David did, how long, O Lord? How long must the suffering go on? How long will injustice go unchecked? We cry out to you, Lord, have mercy. And even as we cry out, Heavenly Father, we know how much more your heart must break, how grieved you must be that the world is so broken and fallen. For you are a compassionate God who upholds the cause of the oppressed. You are a holy God who looks on injustice with a righteous anger. We praise you, Lord, for your justice and your holiness. We cry out with the angels and the 24 elders, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. We declare that you are present, you are powerful and mighty, that your love is stronger than any darkness that we might face, and that your light overcomes the darkness. As we stand in the light of your holiness, we also pray for your forgiveness. We confess that we have sinned against you and your people. We have not loved others as we have loved ourselves. We have benefited from the oppression of others. We have been silent, apathetic, and indifferent to the suffering of others and the injustices they face. We have ignored the injustice and suffering in our own country and in our own communities. Lord, forgive us. Save us from our apathy, from the complacency in our own hearts. Change us, Lord. Open our eyes and our ears to the suffering of others. Your word commands us, your people, to seek justice, encourage the oppressed, and defend the cause of the fatherless. Soften our hearts to care more deeply. Sharpen our minds to think more clearly and clench our fists to fight more fiercely for those who are oppressed. Loving Father, we thank you for your promise that you will hear the prayers of your people. And so we cry out to you against slavery and pray for it to end. We pray for freedom for those who are trapped in forced labor in dangerous conditions with little or no pay and endure great abuse. We pray for those in sex trafficking who have been stripped of their dignity, that they will be rescued. We pray for an end to the horror of cyber sex trafficking of children. Protect them, Lord, from those who seek to harm them. For you, Lord, are a strong tower and a mighty fortress. Deliver them, Lord from their abuser's hands. Lord, bring rescue. We thank you that you are a compassionate God, a God who heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Let your tender love and care surround all those who are enslaved. We know you bear their excruciating fear, hurt, and pain. May they feel your grace, your peace wash over them. And dear Lord, we pray for the survivors of slavery that you might bring healing new joy and hope, where previously they only had shame and fear. We thank you that you can bring beauty out of ashes and that you can restore to them the years that the locusts have eaten. And God of justice, we pray in your powerful name that there will be justice for those who have been wronged. We pray that the oppressors will be arrested and prosecuted and for criminal networks to be dismantled. Give strength to those who investigate and prosecute traffickers. Encourage them when they are weary. Give courage to survivors when they're asked to testify against their former captors. And dear Lord, give us courage and wisdom to stand in solidarity with victims of slavery. Stir up in us a passion for others' freedom that lead us to challenge injustice and fight for change. And as we move deeper into your presence, and the things of your heart, may we also take your light-giving presence deeper into our world's darkness to bring your transforming love, your life-giving freedom. Give us wisdom to know what we can do to eliminate slavery in our lifetime. For your sake and for the sake of all those who are still enslaved, amen. to know
today. So let's take a moment to bring it all together. Peter calls us to live such good lives in this world. And one way we can do that is by submitting to those in leadership over us. After all, it was Jesus himself that lived such a good life in submission to his father so that we could be brought back to God. By his wounds, we are healed. We hope you've had a great time today together, wherever you've been gathered, and we look forward to see you next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>